who don't know me and I'm welcoming you all to our first Tuesday educational series um, provided for Star Hill Center. We are very happy and fortunate this evening to um, feature Chef Antoine Brinson um, with Culinary Concepts of Charlottesville. And we also have Patricia Tyndale, uh, one of um, our Centaur registered dietitians um, will be presenting this evening doing a live, um, Chef Antoine is doing a live recipe. So we're very excited to see what he's going to cook up and we can all um, watch him and then our mouths will probably water. <laughs> but anyway, I'm very happy to have you all um, tuning in tonight. We are recording the session and we will have the recorded session available for viewing. Um, and that, you know, I can send out that link for you all to be able to view um, this night's recording. It probably won't be available um, for about a week or so until we get it edited and everything. Um, but we do have a YouTube channel um, and uh, we have uh, other, um, the previous first Tuesday sessions are all recorded on our YouTube um, channel site. And um, we can post that. I'll try to put that link on the chat as well. And um, our other link where we post um, recipes that have been done um, by Chef Antoine. So I welcome you all and um, please keep your phones muted and we will provide time at the end for questions. Um, I think that's it. So we will present Chef Antoine and Patricia Tyndale. Patricia, go ahead and take it away, girl. Uh, <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Patricia Tyndale. I'm the outpatient dietitian here at uh, Centera Martha Jefferson Hospital. Um, maybe some of you have heard me before speak, but um, for many people, this may be new. So I have worked for Martha Jefferson for five years as a dietitian. I've worked both in the hospital and outside of the hospital, and I've worked at other areas. Um, I've worked in Connecticut as a dietitian for uh, some time as well, prior to being here in Virginia. Uh, so uh, go ahead, Chef Antoine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, Chef Antoine here, owner and founder of Culinary Concepts. Uh, I am uh, a chef a little bit. I like food. I like to cook just a little bit. And uh, I've been doing this about 15 years. I've traveled uh, nationally, internationally. I've spent most of my career in fine dining. Uh, I moved here to Charlottesville about five and a half years ago to, to open up a, a club here in town, a popular club. And then um, I launched my company, Culinary Concepts. And uh, We've been, uh, we've been rocking ever since, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about this partnership and the opportunity to share with you all tonight. Um, this is a, a great dish that we're going to be making here and uh, I'm super excited to hear Patricia's uh, nutritional facts about the food we're going to be cooking. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and transition to screens and, uh, you know, talk a little bit about what we got going on here. So um, Patricia and I, we were talking uh, before, before class on the phone and we were talking about pork. And I was saying that growing up, uh, what was popular in our house was uh, pork chops. And uh, it just so <laughs> happens that uh, pork chops are probably the worst piece of the pork. Well, I wouldn't say the worst, <laughs> but <laughs> the way we cooked them, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> weren't too good for our body. <laughs> and uh, right. you know how the, the pork tenderloin, not only is it a much more uh, tender piece, um, you know, it's, it's low in sugar, you know, the pork tenderloin has a lot less calories than, than pork chops. And, and of course, um, from, from a nutritional standpoint, which Patricia can speak to a little bit more, um, it, it adds a lot of value to, to your diet. But as yeah. she's talking about it, I'm going to start breaking this thing down. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I'm going to pass the mic to Patricia. So on your pork tenderloin, if you ever bought this in a store, you'll notice that it's this white thing on top of the, the loin. And this is called a silver skin. And you always want to try to take that off whenever you're butchering your tenderloin. And I'll show you how to do that here in a second. We're going to get underneath the skin and just take it off. And the reason why you want to take that off is because it's tough. Um, if you ever had uh, ribs, for example, and you don't take that silver skin off the back, you ever have ribs and it's almost like chewing bubble gum? Yeah. <laughs> That's going to happen with your pork tenderloin. It's going to be nice and tender and it's going to be chewy. So you always want to make sure that you take that piece off on the top. But Patricia, can you tell them a little bit? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about our proteins, uh, Chef Antoine is absolutely right. You're going to get tons of protein. If you're going for a leaner meat, such as a pork tenderloin, it's usually going to be lower in calories as well, but really packed with that really good vitamins and minerals. It's also going to give you plenty of uh, other things that you don't commonly think about. Now, uh, the thing about pork you know, you may go to your provider, you may talk to a dietitian or a nutrition specialist, and they may tell you that, you know, to avoid pork at all costs. And that's not actually true. When you're going for any type of pork or beef, you definitely want to look more towards the leaner versions. Okay. Yeah. And I wanted to show you guys this now, the silver skin on um, it, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> it, you would think that, you know, it's so thin, you're like, oh, you know, that's not going to cause any damage. It could really mess mm -hmm. up the fish. You know, it, this is that thing that when you're chewing, it gets stuck in between your teeth. And you're like, what is that being in my teeth? That's, that's, the, that's the silver skin if it's not taken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And is it true, Chef Antoine, that you'll see that on other meats other than pork? Absolutely. Also, so yeah. uh, every tenderloin, regardless if it's veal, beef, uh, pork, lamb, uh, has the, uh, the same silver skin on there. And you'll also find it on, uh, like, for example, I mentioned earlier, ribs. Um, on the back of your ribs, for those of you that like to cook ribs at home, if you ever buy a pack of ribs, turn them over on the back where it curves. And if you just kind of pick at the back, you'll notice that there's a silver skin that you'll pull off on the back there. Now, some people don't take that off because they don't know. But when you take it off, it changes the game. It makes the texture, oh, especially okay. when you braise them really nice and low and slow or if you're smoking them, it'll give you so much value and so much flavor. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So believe it or not, it's okay to have pork. It's okay. It's, uh, we definitely want to go for a leaner version, such as a sirloin. Anytime you see loin at the end of a meat, that's usually going to be a leaner cut versus some of the fatter, fatter, fattier meats that we try to avoid. Awesome. Right? And, and another thing that's beautiful about pork is what you can pair it with. Uh, pork mm. is one of those, those proteins that's super versatile. Because it's so mild in flavor, you can put it with something as simple as blueberries and something as complicated as a, uh, a roasted pork sauce, right? Mm. Um, in this dish, what we're going to do is we're going give, to give our pork a really nice hard roast in the pan. I'm going to show you guys a technique called basting, where you cook the, pan, the pork in its own fat, basted with a little bit of butter, shallots, garlic, and all these flavors, and really infuse flavors into it. And then you finish it with a really nice vinegar-based blueberry sauce. Blueberries are in season right now. And of course, blueberries, they're considered superfood. So there's a ton of nutrition that goes into this dish just with the things that we're pairing it with. So I'm gonna go ahead and, Patricia, you can talk a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and just <laughs> chop up some onions. While you're I hope you guys, I hope you all had dinner before you started watching Chef Antoine. <laughs> I actually, uh, believe it or not, my, um, in my household, we actually don't eat a lot of pork and not because I'm a dietitian, you know, dietitians do eat bacon, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> but my, my husband doesn't eat pork, so we don't tend to have it too often. Um, and we definitely don't make tenderloin at home, but I do know it's a very good piece of meat. And I, of course, grew up on, on pork, so pork chops were common in my household also. Uh, <laughs> so I, I will say I do sneak a little bit of bacon every once in a while, but truly it is about moderation. <laughs> I tell you a funny, a funny story. I shared this with Patricia earlier. You know, I grew up and this is a, this is the story in most black households, right? Like you grow up and pork chops is a part of the menu, right? And, you know, we bread our pork chops, flour. You got to have some seasoning salt. I'm from up north. We mm -hmm. use lorries. So I don't know what they use in the south. Uh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you season your flour and it's fried, right? Like yeah. literally fried. But the problem is we don't just cook it. We cook the mess out of it, like literally it's like shoe leather and you got to put a bunch of hot sauce on it to make it taste like something, right? And, and growing up, that's what you're accustomed to, right? And, it, and this is common in, in most households still. My family still cooks the same way. And it wasn't really until I got into cooking and uh, I really started to understand temperatures uh, where I started to appreciate a perfectly cooked pork tenderloin or a perfectly mm -hmm. cooked pork chop. I tell you what, man, if you cook it just a little bit less, it'll still be done, but the texture will be so amazing. And guess yeah. what? If you cook it just a little bit, a little bit less, it'll have a <laughs> lot more juice in it, a lot more flavor. Yeah. You won't need a cup of something to drink to wash it down. Yeah. <laughs> You're good to go. <laughs> that that is that is so true, Chef Antoine. I know in, in many cultures we tend to prefer our meat well done. 
Um, so there's a fine line between, you know, not being cooked enough and making sure it still has some flavor in it. So that's a pretty good point. Hey, you know, I think it's <laughs> funny though, like, the, and, and, and I, it's funny with my mom, I, my mom, one time she came over and uh, we were, I was cooking and she was like, oh no, you got to cook that a little bit more. I was like, mom, would teach you a trick <laughs> called carry over. She was like, yeah. what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and Let it sit, that, right? Yeah, for those of you that are not familiar with carryover, carryover is essentially the process that happens after you take something out of the pan. It continues to cook. So if you have it in a pan and your pan is at about 375, when you take it out the pan, internally, that thing is going to continue to cook. The temperature is going to continue to rise because it's going to take some time for the exterior to cool down. And that process is called carryover. You can yeah. usually increase the temperature by another five to seven degrees by using that technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. Now I see you're chopping up, you've done the shallots, now you're doing some garlic. Oh man, you, now, can't, you can't make this dish without garlic. <laughs> I'll tell you what. So what we're going to yeah. do is we're going to take some, well, I have some garlic over here in the shell and we're going to smash those up and we're just going to add those to the pan. Again, we're going to infuse our olive oil with shallots, garlic, and thyme. Mm -hmm. Then over here with our kale, which we're going to break down here in a little bit, I'm going to crush the garlic and we're going to chop this up. And this is going to be the base. Again, infusing garlic into the dish. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Patricia can speak to it. Garlic adds a ton of flavor. It's really good for you. Yeah, tons, again, tons of vitamins and minerals. It's actually very healthy, very, you know, cancer protective. It has so many benefits. I talk to a lot of people about infusing flavor into foods without using all of the salt. And, you know, anytime you can get some garlic and some onions as a base to any dish, you're always going to carry that flavor so much further without needing to add so much of the seasonings and especially the salt. I think another interesting thing is that um, a lot of folks don't know this, but garlic doesn't have any calories. So sure. for, mm -hmm. for those of you that are like, you know, I'm watching my calorie intake, garlic, yeah. three cloves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're right about that. <laughs> it, so it, I'm going to show it, you guys it, a little trick because I'm using some kale here. So the kale is still in the stem. A lot of the times folks either feel like they need to braise kale like collard greens because it is a it is a uh, a much more dense green but a little trick to kind of uh to to get it to be not so tough the, the toughest part on the kale is the stem right that thick piece of stem uh -huh. so what you do is you just make a little okay sign like this right you put it put your, your kale in there and just pull up you can pull this oh right off, look at that yeah. just like that and uh, for those of you that have kids at home, this is, if you want, if you're looking for a sous chef, this is a great thing to pass off to them. Yeah. They don't need a knife. They can do all the kale, especially if you got a family of three or four. This is a great job yeah. for the kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's a good, I really love that you're using those fresh greens. I think people get a little bit of a fear of using the fresh greens and kale is a great way to go. When you remove that stem, you can cook it a lot quicker. It still holds a lot of its good nutritional value, tons of fiber, tons of water, again, tons of vitamins and minerals. Um, I really like that you're using the kale and believe it or not, kale is in the, it's classified as what we call a cruciferous vegetable, which is a cancer protective vegetable. So Anytime you can use kale, you know, sauteed, even raw in a smoothie or something like that, it's only going to benefit you. That's awesome. So, Patricia, I'm going to go ahead and change screens. We're going to go over to the stove and cook. Is everybody ready to cook? I don't know. I don't think, I don't think Ruth's ready. Ruth, Ruth doesn't look ready to cook. I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's go over to the stove. All right. So we have our pork tenderloin over here. The first thing that I'm gonna do is go ahead and season my pork tenderloin. I'm not gonna cook it right away. We're gonna actually get our sauce going first, but I wanna definitely get some seasoning on there. So notice that I have it on a rack right now. So I'm just gonna go ahead and season the first side like this, turn it and season the back of it. Now, some of you are like, oh my God, he's putting so much salt on it. Why is he putting so much salt on that? Well, the reason is because when we cook this, most of the salt and the pepper is gonna wash off into our pan. And that seasoning is actually gonna season our oil. So we're gonna be cooking with seasoned oil that's gonna add a lot more flavor. Before this dish is done, I promise you, we're gonna to have to season it again. Mm -hmm. And now one thing you can say if you were making this dish at home, you know, 
whomever is going to, you know, eat the pork tenderloin, just let them know you don't need the salt shaker at the dinner table because there is flavor infused into the meat. So we don't I, need the additional sodium, right? I, I appreciate you saying that so much. I feel like that, <laughs> that is a culture thing, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, Where you, absolutely. you feel like you have to have salt and pepper. I encourage all of you, when you're cooking at home, taste your food as you're cooking it. That will give you the confidence in knowing that your food is seasoned properly. If you're not tasting your food as you go along, you're going to make an assumption that you need to add more salt onto it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, you're hurting your body. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead. So and I like it. Oh, go ahead, Patricia. Go ahead. Oh, I like everything you're doing so far. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and add my water in here, a little bit of vinegar, and a little bit of sugar. Now, what we're making here is called a gastrique. And a gastrique is pretty much a vinegar-based sauce, right? And in the process of making this gastrique, we're gonna add our blueberries. I'm just gonna go ahead and whisk this a little bit to make sure that my sugar is dissolved, just like that. And in the process of making this, we're gonna add our blueberries once this comes up a little bit. And when, as it continues to cook down, there's no lid on here, it's gonna reduce and the blueberries are actually gonna uh, help the sauce thicken. Um, and as it gets to almost like a, a, a slightly thick texture, that's when the blueberries start to break down, we're gonna take it off and we can puree it. Now with this particular sauce, you do not have to puree, it, right? If you decide that, hey, I like the texture of blueberries, I wanna have some of those on my pork, go for it. There's no wrong to it. Yeah, I really, I really enjoy all of the different flavor components you're using other than salt. Uh, the, the vinegar is a, a great addition. Uh, I think sometimes people, again, shy away from vinegar or forget to use it. It's a really good way to flavor your foods. Absolutely. One thing, uh, so I used to live in the Caribbean, and uh, one thing I fell in love with out there, they have something called pepper water. And pepper water is essentially when they take hot peppers out the garden, and they'll put it in uh, some vinegar, and you'll have it on the table. And it's literally mm -hmm. like hot, spicy vinegar. Um, but that's that's oh, their hot wow. sauce, right? I actually have like some at my house right now. Um, but with vinegars, there's so many different things you can do with them. You can add fresh herbs to your vinegar and infuse flavor mm -hmm. to them. You can add peppers to it to infuse spice. Um, and you can use it as a, as a way to not only season your food and finish it, but also as a way to, to make a sauce. You can use it as a base for dressing, you know, oh, any gosh. kind of salad dressing that you buy in the store, you can make it home with red wine vinegar, balsamic vinegar, apple cider vinegar. Absolutely. Um, and you know, I, I think a lot of times folks tend to shy away from it because they don't know what they taste like. And, and again, here's Chef encouraging you. I encourage you to taste your vinegars. I know it sounds crazy. When you taste white vinegar, it really doesn't have any flavor. But when you taste red wine mm -hmm. vinegar, balsamic vinegar, yeah. um, white wine vinegar, they all have completely different tastes. And the more that you understand the flavor profile, the better you can incorporate them into different dishes. Yeah, you're right. I think I've used red wine vinegar if I make like a, a cold pasta salad. Yes. Uh, one way that I use balsamic vinegar, which I think it sounds weird to people, but if you make some Brussels sprouts and you saute them, and then when they're just about done, you know, add some, toss them in some balsamic vinegar right before you serve them. It really brings out the flavor of that. So, Girl, you got my mouth <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening over here right now. So whenever I'm starting to cook, what I like to do is turn my pan on high for 30 seconds. And the reason why I do that is to take the chill off of my pan. So I'm gonna let this heat up a little bit, then I'm gonna drop my heat down. One, this is gonna help you uh, get your pan heated up much faster. And two, this is gonna allow you to regulate your temperature a lot easier, right? With this, uh, with the pork, we're actually gonna be cooking on a medium high. So I do wanna get it to a point to where it's slightly smoking, but I'm gonna go ahead and add in my olive oil. You're gonna need roughly about two tablespoons of olive oil for this dish. Yeah. And olive oil is, as we know, is one of the more heart healthy oils. So you're always going to do your heart well when you make sure you incorporate more olive oil in your cooking. Absolutely. Now, a great way to tell if your pan is hot enough. I'm going to hold it up a little higher for you guys to see it. If you move your pan, oil in your pan around and it moves like molasses, chances are your oil is not hot enough. But if it moves like mine, where it's moving almost like water, and that's telling you that your, your pan has enough heat 
to where you can start to cook in it. Now, because I want my pan to get to medium high, I'm gonna let mine actually heat up a little bit more. I wanna see a little bit of smoke coming out the back of my pan. And again, I don't, want it, I don't want to burn the pan, but I do wanna know that it's hot enough for me to put my pork in. Because what I'm doing is I'm introducing a cold pork tenderloin to a hot pan. So when I put that cold pork in the pan, the temperature is gonna drop down, right? So by having it at a medium high, it's gonna allow me to maintain the temperature and get a really nice sear on the pork. Now, the technique that I'm showing you here today, basting, is gonna allow us to cook the pork on top of the stove. This won't need to see any oven time here. The proper internal temperature for pork is, um, oh, kick, kick my cutting board, is uh, one, uh, 145, right? And for those of you that wanna take it up to 155, you can do that. Um, and the best way to check your temperature is by using a thermometer. So now, when, when would you when would you take the temperature? Would you do it right when you take it out of the pan, or would you do it after you let it rest? Yes, I would. You would take it out of the pan, let it sit on the side here, and then you would tip the center of the protein. Now, a miss a miss uh, understanding. A lot of times when folks are taking the temperature, what they do is they either go in the thinnest part, or they tend to go too far through it, and they're like, "Oh my God, it's not even cooked." Um, so you want to you want to stop it. I'm going to hold this up for everyone to see. You want to stop it about right there in the middle. Right. You want to go into the thickest part of the meat and stop mm -hmm. it right in the middle of the meat, about right there. Mm -hmm. And that's going to give you the best temperature. So now. My, uh, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say my pan is starting to smoke. It's right where it needs to be. So when I have my pork to the pan, it's very important that when you're doing this, you always want to let your pork or your protein fall away from you, not towards you. And that way you can avoid any uh, splash, splashes on your arms and your hands. So I'm going to just take this set it in the front and away. Now, someone actually did chime in into the chat, Chef Antoine, asking a question. This is a really good question. Uh, Mr. Childers said, I thought cooking with olive oil at high temperatures denatures the oil and changes the chemistry of the oil, making it unhealthy to eat. I really love this question. And I am sure Chef Antoine That is a great question, chime. right? And that's with any <laughs> oil if you, if you have it too hot. I would say right now my oil is sitting probably at about... 375, right? And that's where it's a good heat to where it's smoking. It's not above 400 degrees. Now, if you get your pan to a point to where your oil is starting to turn brown, that's denaturing your oil. That means that your pan is too hot. But getting it to the point, which is called the smoking point, getting it to the smoking point, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's the power of really controlling your heat. It's a fantastic question. Yeah, that's actually exactly what I was going to say. You, you're not cooking it until it's brown and burn. You're just cooking it enough to get it hot, right? And, and remember, by adding this pork to the pan, my pork is cold. I can tell you that my pan has dropped in temperature significantly because of the cold temperature of the pork. Mm -hmm. So it is actually okay to cook with olive oil and to let it heat up some. You're not. And I'm just going to move my pan so I can show you guys how much heat. I don't have much heat on my pan. You can barely see it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just important to be able to uh, regulate. I think a lot of the times folks either have their pan too high or too low. Yes, right? that's true. You want to yep. try to balance on that good medium, medium high, you know, and try to live in that area. Um, and that'll help you regulate the temperature. Yes, yeah. it will take a little bit longer to cook, but in the end, you'll have a much better product. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ch Childers, for uh, chiming in on that. And, and just to let you all know, if there's any other kind of quick questions you have like that, feel free to type it into the chat. I do check it periodically just to help things along. So I'm going to hold this up so everybody can see what's happening here. And you can see this just cooking down really nice, beautiful. You can see the texture starting to change a little mm -hmm. bit. And that's what we're going for here. So right. I practice what I preach. If you remember earlier, I said you want to taste your food as it's cooking. I'm going to add a pinch of salt in there. Mm -hmm. Whenever you hear me say a pinch, it's three fingers, right? Um, if you wanted to measure that out, that's about a fourth of a teaspoon. And I'm going to just get a spoon here. I'm just using a plastic spoon. And I'm going to just taste my sauce, right? Where's my flavor at, right? Very important to do mm -hmm. that. Oh, yes. I can taste the time. I can taste the acidity. That's that's right where it needs to be. Yes, the and, and perfect. 
And then the other thing is, I didn't really speak on it too much, but I, you know, flavor is very important and we can get it in, in so many ways and adding those herbs like that thyme or, you know, rosemary, sage, anytime you're cooking with those herbs, it's going to give you so much flavor without really uh, impacting you negatively. So. Absolutely. And, you know, to, to, to kind of piggyback off of that, I encourage you to taste your herbs in their raw state. Oh, yeah. Know what mm -hmm. they taste like, just like we were talking about with the vinegar, right? Know what they taste like. If you understand the flavor profile, it'll guide you in knowing how mm -hmm. to do this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I figured out how to do herbs just by kind of trial and error, you know, um, which, you know, I know sage goes really well with chicken. I know cilantro goes really well with, you know, any type of like Mexican dishes. Thyme is great for chicken. I think thyme is my favorite herb. Yes. I mean, like, and a lot of folks don't realize that, you know, a lot of the herbs cross culture, right? They cross mm -hmm. over. Uh -huh. can be found in, you know, not just the Mexican cuisine, yeah. but Mexican cuisine, um, Indian cuisine. Uh -huh, um, yeah. You wouldn't know it because the way that it pairs with different spices, right? Mm -hmm. So just keep familiar with, your, your, with the different flavors that you like, and you'll be able to recognize them in different dishes. Yeah, yeah. Now I, and, and. You know, Chef Antoine is making that that sauce with the blueberries. You know, remember, blueberries are some of the best fruits for you to have, right? Along with raspberries and strawberries and blackberries. Those are going to give you the most fiber. They're going to be lower in, in sugar, so it's not going to spike your blood sugars up as much if you're diabetic. So I want to show everybody the, let me take a look at that pork, right? Yeah. Beautiful golden brown sear, right? Not overcooked, really nice temperature, really nice color. Yeah. You flip it over on the other side, it's just starting to turn brown, right? So at this mm -hmm. stage where I have a nice caramelization on the exterior, I'm going to go ahead and add in that crushed garlic that I have. I'm going to go ahead and add in some of that sliced shallot, right? And again, this is going to infuse flavor into my oil. Mm -hmm. A little bit of thyme, right? And I'm just going to add a little it. bit more olive oil in here because I'm going to use this oil foundationally to base. And I added in about another tablespoon. So you hear that, that popping going on there, right? And that's just the, uh, the thyme and all of those beautiful flavors infusing. Now, what I like to do whenever I base, Patricia's going to hate me for this, but I like to <laughs> infuse a little bit of butter into uh, my basting. And the reason why is because the milk salads, they start to brown. And the browning of the milk salads helps the caramelization of your protein. So it actually helps cook it and give you a lot of flavor. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in just a tablespoon here, just like that. Now, whenever you're basting, what I like to do is tilt my pan up slightly. So all the fat runs to one side and I literally just take it and put it on top. So take the fat on top, just like that, just on top. Nope. And what I like to tell people about butter, it's okay to use butter in small amounts. You know, that one tablespoon, that's covering all of your meat, right? It's, you're, you're not looking to use an entire stick of butter in that pork tenderloin. You're just using a little bit for the flavor. And I think that's okay to do. We don't need to have butter on everything all day on our toast and on our vegetables and everything. Use olive oil more. Use those flavor uh, profiles with the garlic and the onions and the herbs. And if you notice, like right now, uh, you know, the, the fat is starting to turn brown a little bit, right? Uh -huh. so I can either go in with a little bit more olive oil, as Patricia mentioned, I can go with a little olive oil in there. Uh -huh. Or if you're like me, you can go with a little bit more butter. I'm going to go with a little bit more butter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Patricia. It needs it. No, that's okay. And believe it or not, um, they do have, you can find in grocery stores, you can find butter that's actually mixed with olive oil. And what that does is it cuts down on the saturated fat, similar to what Chef Antoine is doing. He's not just using butter. He's using the olive oil also, which I really like. So I'm going to share something a little personal here. And I'm just going to hold this up so you guys can see it. I'm going to give it a little shake real quick. I'm going to just... Slide this off so I can show you guys this sauce. So remember I said it's going to cook down and get pretty thin? Yeah. Yeah. Look at that texture. Yep, that looks great. Look at that beautiful texture. Oh, my gosh. That is, that's it. Yep. I think I could put that on anything. <laughs> so now here's the trick, folks. At this stage, a lot of folks kind of fall in and are like, oh, my God, it's delicious. It's done. And they forget to do something important. 
take the time out. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. There is time still in our soul. So you want to make sure. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. Time. You got some, <laughs> I got some time right here. There's one sprig of time. And I want to point out, I did adjust my heat down over here for those of you watching my pork do its thing. Let me take this other one out. There we go. Very important. Um, that could really mess up a dish. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm just facing that. And my goodness, absolutely, absolutely happy with it. <laughs> so I'm gonna tilt this up again, guys. And I'm, the technique here is you, you get the spoon into the butter like this, and you're just tossing it on top of your pork. And mm -hmm. you know, the technique, just like that, right? And up, and up. Yeah. Base both tenderloins in the pan just like this and why and that's gonna, no, what is that going to do chef antoine is no, that just going to keep the flavor going through the meat well not just that but it's allowing you to cook the bottom and the top at the same time because mm. your oil is the same temperature as the bottom of your pan so why mm -hmm. you have direct heat here you're cooking this with indirect heat mm -hmm. Look at that. Oh my God. And you're going to see things like the shallots start to melt into your pork. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just kind of check this out. So right now this pork probably has, and in cooking time, I'm going to flip it over. It probably has another three minutes on it. Right? Because okay. You're relying on what, what's that technique called again? Does anybody remember? Carry over. All right. Let's finish this pork <laughs> Now, uh, Chef Antoine, are there other meats that you could make this recipe with? Uh, yeah, if you wanted to use a, um, if you wanted to use beef, like for example, a, a beef tenderloin for those of you oh, yeah. that like um, uh, uh, a strip loin, you can do a strip loin with this. Uh, you can do mm -hmm. a ribeye. Actually, ribeye is my favorite to cook this way. <laughs> you can. Um, but you can I won't also, say anything also, about it. <laughs> you can also do your chicken. So, for example, chicken thigh. This technique. Oh, yeah. Chicken thigh. Well, good. So, for anyone who, who may not eat pork, you, you could still make this recipe and substitute. I, you know, I tell people that a lot. You can substitute things out. You don't have to, you know, use butter. You can use olive oil. You don't have to use pork. You can use chicken, right? Yeah, and I'm going to hold this up. Look at the shallots in there, guys. Look how beautiful those shallots are. Beautiful <laughs> roasted shallots, right? So you have yep. those roasted shallots, that roasted garlic, all that flavor. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to set it on top of my pork. So as I'm basting it, I'm just going to want that yep. flavor to just melt into my pork. Yeah. Like that. So this piece over here is a lot smaller. So chances are it's going to finish first. So I'm very mm -hmm. aware of that. So I'm just kind of notice that I keep checking it to see where my temperature is at. And between the shallots and the garlic and the pork, you're going to get some really good zinc. You're going to get protein. You're going to get some good B vitamins, selenium. You're going to get so many vitamins and minerals uh, from this dish. And this is almost there. Oh, my gosh. I wish you guys could smell this. <laughs> Now, uh, now, Chef Antoine, I know that uh, we're making this dish and you're using the kale, but I'm curious what kind of, you know, side dish, I guess I'm thinking more like a carbohydrate, what would go great with this? Would you do like a mashed potato, like a sweet potato or? No, it, it, it's uh, a great question. Um, you know, it really depends on the season. Um, you know, mashed potato, sweet potato would be fantastic. I would say I would serve that with this dish in the fall. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, nice uh, curry sweet potatoes would go beautiful with this for those of you that are into spices. Oh. Uh, and, uh, you know, this again, I mentioned this earlier, pork is so versatile. Real quick, I want to pause on that real quick. I want to tell you guys what's happening. So I've turned my pan off. There's no heat on my pan right now. But because I'm using what's called a heavy bottom pan, the plate on the bottom of my pan is about that thick. And it's holding the heat. So I don't know if you can hear that. It sounds like it's still cooking, but that's the residual heat that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Right Now I can take this out the pan and it cool down a lot faster, but I want this to cook just a little bit more because I'm just checking my temperature. And this is actually perfect. It's right where it needs to be. But I wanted to sit in this pan and come down naturally. So I'm gonna let it do its thing and come down. But to go back to your quick question, uh, Patricia. So depending on what season you're in, you can use many different things. 
Um, again, the sweet potatoes you mentioned, I would use those in the fall, but I would also go as far as saying, if you guys are into like rutabaga, they braise that oh. really, really, really nicely. I like to do my rutabaga with a little bit of crushed garlic, some thyme, maybe some mm -hmm. vegetable stock. If you guys make pork stock, um, and just season it. Um, if you, again, if you if that healthy butter that Patricia was talking about, that butter, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but then a couple of sprigs of thyme, and just literally cover that with some foil, put it in your oven at 350, and let it braise, and it cooks down beautifully. And guess what? You mm -hmm. can take it out. And it'll give you texture, right? So you'll still have that nice soft texture, and it'll and it'll give you so much flavor that's infused into the liquid um, by cooking it low and slow. Uh -huh. So I'm gonna slide this to the back, Patricia, because my fork is actually. I'm just gonna go ahead and take it out because I uh, I'm feeling confident. I'm gonna let that sit <laughs> right here, just like that. I'm going for a perfect fork here, and then I'm gonna yeah. position my pans here and just bring this pan up. Now, again, you know, I'm using a uh, heavy bottom pan, so my pan is not hot. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the heat on high for about 30 seconds. And that's just to take the chill off of my pan. And we're going to go ahead and do our kale. Now, on our kale, we're going to use a technique called wilting, right? We're not trying to saute the kale, right? I'm not trying to cook the mess out of it. I'm kind of trying to cook it low and slow. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, again, use that residual heat in the pan to carry over and allow the kale to just cook down slightly, but not to the point to where it's like uh -huh. a sauteed spinach. So I'm gonna go right. ahead and drop that heat down to a medium on there. And I'm gonna let this sit for just a second. I'm gonna transition to talk to you really quick about the tomatoes that I'm using. So I have, you know, in the recipe, it calls for either grape tomatoes or cherry tomatoes, and they're a lot smaller than these. But I came across these tomatoes and I taste one and I was like, oh, my God, they are so delicious. Right. Um, and what we're going to do with this with the, with this technique that we're using on the stove today is uh, we're going to do a blister on our tomatoes. Right. And what that means is we're going to allow the high heat to blister the outside of our tomato, but the inside of our tomato maintains its integrity and stays nice and soft. So you're gonna have a really nice cooked outside where it's almost charred and roasted, and then you're gonna have a really nice raw tomato finish inside. It's, it's absolutely divine. I highly recommend doing this. This is probably the only way we cook kale in my house. <laughs> it's absolutely good. Let's head back over to the stove. Yeah. And I like what you're doing with the tomatoes too. I like you're incorporating those. Again, tom tomatoes, again, another really nutrient packed uh, food item that you're using. Tomatoes have tons of lycopene, which is a, a, a really good vitamin, a really good nutrient for you, especially if you're um, a male and you have a risk for prostate cancer, anytime you can use more tomatoes, it's only gonna help you. That's awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, add in my, uh, my garlic. And I'm using three cloves of garlic here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get that in the pan. And you're gonna hear that. More garlic. flavor, I like it. Oh man, it's doing its thing already, look at that. Add a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more olive oil in there. Bit. I ha I I do have difficulty with garlic with you know how long are you supposed to cook it before it you add something else to it to keep it from burning because is it true that garlic will burn pretty quickly? You can see some of the pieces starting to turn brown in my pan. Absolutely mm -hmm. does. But at this stage right here, this is what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. oh, my pan is off. Residual heat. Ah, okay, yeah. got it. Then I'm gonna use my spoon. I'm gonna put my spoon there. Here it is. And just mix that garlic in, those tomatoes in, with that kale. You can hear that kale responding to the heat. Yeah. Beautiful roasted garlic on that kale. I'm gonna hold that up for everybody to kind of see that garlic. That oh, looks great. Kale. Oh man, you can hear yeah. it. <laughs> oh, like so don't be afraid of the kale. Oh, don't be. Look how of easy that was. And then a little bit of salt. Uh -huh. Make a pinch again, right? And then I had told you earlier that this is just going to be a wilt. Look at that. The kale mm -hmm. still has its integrity, right? You can still see yeah. the but you can see that the color has changed, where it's yeah. a darker green, right? And the longer that it sits in this pan, the more it's going to wilt, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to finish this with some lemon juice. You have some pieces that are, that are going to be a little bit less wilted than others, but that mm -hmm. texture, oh my gosh, that texture is absolutely amazing. 
I, I know some folks uh, decide not to go with the leafy greens because they uh, may have been told not to have leafy greens while they're on uh, Coumadin or Warfarin. And believe it or not, you can still have kale. You can have leafy greens. It's all about how much you have. You wouldn't, you know, randomly sit down to a big bowl of salad or kale. You can have small amounts and, and you really want to have it regularly versus having a lot at one time and then not having it for a, a long time. So. Even if your doctor tells you you can't have kale, you can have it. You just want to be consistent and try not to have too much at once. I'm going to hold that up for everybody to see. Oh, yeah. Look at that. And that has reduced a lot. Yes. <laughs> and that's what I was saying. So blueberries, and you'll find apples, it has the most of it, has what's called pectin. And pectin uh -huh. is a natural thickener. Um, so that's what allows our sauce to have body. And as you let your sauce cool down, it will continue to thicken up. And that's the uh -huh. in it, right? So what we're going to do here now, I'm, I was actually going to puree this, but I'm so happy with it that I think I'm going to just roll with it like this. It's really good texture. Um, uh -huh. but you can't, you can't, again, you can't puree this sauce. I'm going to slide this over here in the back. And we're going to bring some stuff over, bring my uh, other pan right here. Oh, man, we're getting close. We're getting close. <laughs> I'm excited. Oh, <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead and bring over that fork, right? So I'm going to use what's called mm -hmm. a slicing knife here that I'm going to use to slice it. So remember, I, I kind of rested the garlic on top. Now, this is something that's not in the recipe that I'm going to share with my garlic lovers out there, okay? So if you're a really <laughs> big fan of garlic, one thing that I love to do, I do this in the wintertime, I'll take a head of garlic, I'll take one of these, Olive oil, salt, pepper, wrap it in foil, 400 degrees in the oven, and just roast it in the shell mm -hmm. like this. And you can pop them out. Well, guess what we just did with that? Exactly what we would have did in the oven, right? And mm -hmm. you open this thing up, and I'm just going to go ahead and just crack it off the shell. And you have a really nice roasted piece of garlic. Mm -hmm. Those of you that really love garlic, if you want to just slice this a little bit like that and just add this to your kale, Game changer. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Game I like changer. that. And you can use roasted garlic in many things, right? Oh, oh, yes. Roasted garlic is good in everything, and it's good in mm -hmm. nothing. It's good just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and, and slice both of these because I want to show you guys the contrast between the two, right? So mm -hmm. this is the, uh, the larger piece here. So whenever I slice, I always encourage, a lot of times when people slice, they go like this. You got a long <laughs> night for a reason. Use it. <laughs> I'm going to slide this up a little bit, starting here in the back, and a little push forward, and a push back. Again, a little Oh, that forward. looks perfect. And uh, I did my job, right? We'll push forward. Yeah. Push back, <laughs> you know what you're doing. <laughs> and remember I said resting it? Look at that beautiful cook. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful cook. So now this is what you would call more of like a, a medium well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some for, for those of you that don't know, know medium well, you're going to say that's medium, all right? And then <laughs> my mom, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I'm going to set that over here so everyone can see that. And then I'm going to slice this one. And I'm actually going to start at the smaller part to show you the difference, right? So I'm going to just yep. do a slice here, another little slice there, one more, and one more. Oops, like that. And I'm going to fall down. Now, yeah, go for it. If, if you're wondering about, you know, a serving size of meat, it's typically going to be about the size of the palm of your hand. So okay. notice, notice how different these are, right? And I'm yep. gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the back one, this one on the back and then on the front so we can all take a look together, right? So if you take a look at this one, notice this is a lot more white. This is cooked, yep. all, right? But I also want to point out, notice how juicy it is. So yeah. Dry, right? This one, it, because it's a larger piece, they cooked in the same pan the same amount of time, but because it's mm -hmm. a little bit bigger, it, has a, a, it, it looks like it's been cooked a little bit less. So it's just important to be able to recognize that, you know, depending on the size of your protein, they will have different cook times, right? Yeah, so yeah, So I'm gonna yeah. just slide this over here. I'm gonna do a couple more slices on this pork. Now again, meat, your meat serving is about the size of the palm of your hand. It may be a little bit smaller, maybe closer to three ounces for women and maybe four as much as five ounces for men, not 18 ounces, not 10 ounces. <laughs> nice. I like that you use such a small piece of meat. You know, some people, uh, 
I, I think culturally here, here in America, I think we tend to eat more meat than, than we have to actually. So. Yeah. You know, I think that also like, you know, you, you want to get in the, in the habit of appreciating the flavors, right? I think mm-hmm. about myself growing up, you know, we used a lot of hot sauce and a lot of ketchup, right? <laughs> And it was about volume, not quality. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, as you get older, um, you know, I always encourage folks, you know, just take the time to appreciate a piece of cake. Yeah, appreciate it's true. Blueberries for what Absolutely. They you know, and it is really I, you know, funny story. I was actually, um, I joined the Navy when I was 18. And if anyone who, who, anyone who has ever been in the military knows that when you're going through that kind of boot camp period, you probably have a total of about five minutes to eat as much as you can. And if you do not eat in that time frame, you will not last throughout the uh, physical activity. So you get used to eating a lot very fast. And and that kind of negates the whole tasting the foods and catching the flavor. So I like that you said that. It reminded me of my younger days. (laughs) I almost forgot something that was super important. So I'm glad you said that. Oh, the lemon. We need some lemon, y'all. We can't finish this dish without you know having some acidity so i'm going to show you a trick one the first trick is you want to use the zest so i'm using what's called a zester here what i like to do yeah. is bottom little rotate on there a little zest into my uh my kale that's going to give us a pop and flavor right? yeah i like that yeah now whenever you zest you never want to zest all the way down to the white part notice that it's still like a little bit of yellowish white it's not white white that white part is called piff and is bitter and it would completely mess up your dish you don't want to do that Right. The second thing that I'm going to show you on here is uh, I'm going to cut this lemon in half. Um, You guys ever try to get all the juice out of your lemon? You ever ever get all the juice out of lemon? Whoever came up with that saying, man, we need to to, uh, have a conversation, right? You can't, uh, life is not like lemons. You can't get all the juice out of a lemon. So what are you trying to do? Here's a trick for you to get all the juice out, right? So why can't you get all the juice out of lemon? It's that little piece down the middle, right? That's the barrier. So what you do mm-hmm. is you take your knife, 90 degree angle, on one side of that little white piece right down the middle, flip it over the other side, same thing, down, and then that piece comes right out, right? Mm-hmm. So now, guess what? We have now unlocked the lemon, right? We have access to a lemon that just drips in your hand without even yep. squeezing it. And it also makes it a lot easier to get the seeds out, right? So I don't yep. all of my lemon, I'm gonna cut it in half, and uh, what I like to do with this, bring this over here, is uh, hand over the pan and mm-hmm. squeeze, just like that, right? I like that you're using the lemon. Another flavor component has a really good vitamin C. I think I've used lemon as a finisher in so many vegetables. Take a look at that. There's, there's yeah. a lot. <laughs> So maybe he didn't, he didn't, he should have said that trick when he, when whoever came up with that, he or she came up with that quote, All right? So I'm going to kind of mix that lemon in there. All right, now we're good to go. All right, so I'm going to set that back over here, coming back with my plate. So what I like to do whenever I plate up, you know, it's all about presentation. I like to get a little bit of the kale down in the center of the plate, just like this, All right? And whenever we're plating uh, as a chef, we always look at the plate as a clock, right? So you have 12 o'clock, three, six, and nine. So, you know, whenever you're, you're, you're plating, you know, if you're, if you're telling, if you're, if you're plating up with a, with a kid, you know, 12 o'clock, right? <laughs> three o'clock, however, and it makes it a lot easier to know where you're going. So uh-huh. I'm going to go down with a little bit more of my, my uh, kale right there, happy with it, right? Uh-huh. This tomato up, so I was telling you about that blistered tomato, uh-huh. that tomato, right? So give me- That a looks great. Those beautiful tomatoes on there. Maybe one or two right there, right down the side. And then I'm going to go ahead and get my pork right here. It's going to turn that around, rotate it, and just kind of lay that along the side here, going down. Uh-huh. Beautiful. And then we're going to finish that with this sauce, right? So now I, this is great because I want to show you a trick. So notice that, remember I said as it cools down, it's going to get tighter. Look how tight uh-huh. that sauce is, right? So now it's like a jam. So what you want to do, if you want to get some body back in your sauce, just a couple, a little bit of water, right? right? Uh, I'm literally putting in about a teaspoon, not even that. I would say this is probably like a quarter teaspoon of liquid. You know, just, uh-huh. you guys can see it. I'm just going to mix that in. And that's just going to allow me to have a little bit more fluidity with the sauce, right? Uh-huh. Just like that. And I'll take my sauce, get it mixed in, a little bit around, just like that. I like it around the plate. I love this. Yeah. Mm. 
just like that, right? Now, I have another question from Gertie. Uh, does the portion size for meat change when the meat is thicker or thinner? Uh, it does a little bit. You're looking at something, uh, Gertie, that's about the size of the, um, a deck of cards. That's about the thickness that you are looking for. So if you have something that's twice as thick, you would want to use something that's a little bit smaller. Look at that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who's going to take it? <laughs> <laughs> that looks great. No, I think it's time for me to eat now. <laughs> you know, a, a lot of a lot of things to unpack in this dish, right? You learned a technique called basting. You learned about the kale, how to wilt the kale, right? You mm -hmm. learned how to properly make a sauce. All of these little things can be extracted and incorporated into different dishes in different parts of your cooking, regardless if it's lunch or dinner. So I hope you guys yeah. learned something today. That's the most important part. That was great. Thank you, Chef Antoine. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Now I am very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, I think I need to be there just to make sure everything yeah, goes I, well. Yeah, I think you're right, Satur. If you're you not there, I'll be there. We had that conversation and we're like, should we do it at the kitchen? We <laughs> need an um, in-person class next time. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to my in my castle <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> we'll have to take um, a field trip to this... tour huh say it again we'll have to take a field trip yes i think i so. said we'll have to take a field trip the, yes i agree <laughs> 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 yeah um this was wonderful um chef antoine and patricia both i mean i'm very, very informative, great information for us to learn from. And um, you make it look so easy, <laughs> Chef Antoine. <laughs> yeah. But well, I do you know, think a lot of your techniques were very simple and easy and doable. Um, and those are, um, you incorporated a lot of the um, veggies that we are providing through our Fresh Pharmacy Program um, at the Star Hill Center. We just recently had blueberries and kale um, in the bag um, last week and I believe week before. We've had blueberries a couple of times this season already. And um, these are great ideas. Um, I know for myself, you get tired of fixing the same thing all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, you look for ideas to change up a dish. So this is a great um, example of that. Um, Chef Antoine, will you be um, sending me or posting the um, recipe? Yes, I actually sent it in the original email, but I'll send it again uh, after this class. Okay, all right. Yes, um, and then I just wanna say one more thing. This dish is all about seasonality, right? Mm -hmm. Our tomatoes, our kale, our blueberries, it's all in season. And I encourage you, I challenge you to, when you go to the store, try to buy things that you know are new to you. Try mm -hmm. something different. Try to cook it. You're never going to know unless you try. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Um, lots of positive comments coming through um, yeah. that I noticed um, that it's awesome and people have really, really enjoying this session. Um, a lot of, um, we had a lot of questions. Um, does anybody have any questions um, that they want to speak directly <clears throat> to Chef Antoine before we close out in a little bit? I just want to give people an opportunity to Let's ask questions. Sure. Please. Hi, Ellen. How are you? <laughs> make sure we get that recipe for the green because that looks kind of, I like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Definitely I will definitely it. send it out. Yeah. I'll send it out and we'll post it on our websites. Move to <laughs> Health Equity and um, we've got the you, um, Your Life Matters website. We've got several um, websites that we post on so we'll get it out to everyone absolutely and, it, and I, again like uh you know i always say this in, in classes that i do i challenge you encourage you to make this dish your own how can you incorporate your own flavors your own spices you know maybe try a different uh, version of citrus maybe uh you know try to cook it a little bit less you know just try mm -hmm. something different with it and uh over time you know this this definitely will become your recipe and a part of your repertoire I have to say, I've not tried. I mean, this was new to me, um, the way you cook the pork loin. I mean, I have cooked pork, pork loin many times. I usually um, brown it in the pan, but I never cooked it on top of the stove, you know, 
like you just did. Um, so I definitely will try that. <laughs> Chef Antoine, someone else did have a, have a question. They were asking, what was the garlic trick that you mentioned? What was the roasted garlic trick that you mentioned? Yeah, so the garlic that we put in the pan, so I don't know if you remember earlier on, I just smashed the garlic. I didn't take it out of the shell. And as I was cooking the pork in the pan, I was allowing that garlic to infuse flavor into our oil. But at the same time, that garlic was roasting in the pan, taking on flavor. So mm -hmm. at the end, when I pulled it out, I'm going to bring that pan back. Um, and we actually have some garlic in there right here. Uh, oh, yeah. It's all nice and roasted. Just uh -huh. pop that garlic out of the shell, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Chef Antoine, I, I really appreciate all the fresh, um, healthy ingredients that you use, mm -hmm. the tomatoes, the kale, the garlic, the, the lemon, everything you use, the olive oil. I really appreciate uh, all of the nutrient dense things that you used. It's, yeah. it's all about, it's all about, you know, a mindset, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you think that you can do it, you will do it. And I think a lot yeah. of times folks tend to shy away from eating healthy yeah. because they think that they can't, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one thing I'll, I'll share with you guys personal, you know, I had an addiction to chips. I love chips. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. And, 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 and how, did I, how did I curve my addiction? I just stopped buying them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or make kale chips. You can make kale chips. You can make kale you, chips. You find, exactly. You, I was going to say that you find different ways to still yeah. get that fix. You know, you can get it through many different ways. Um, kale chips is one of them, um, but in a healthier version. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, are there any other questions anybody else had? If not, um, yeah, this was great, you guys. <laughs> Thank you for organizing it, Satora. Um, um, this was really great and fun. Um, yeah. I really appreciate um, you and uh, Chef Antoine doing this for us. It was a great um, presentation. And we'll get the um, video edited and <clears throat> out as soon as possible mm -hmm. and the recipes as well. Um, thank everyone for tuning in. I appreciate the support this evening. Yeah. So have a good rest of the evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank and you don't everybody. forget to get the recipe for the uh, blueberry.